Please note that though this is a spoiler-free review of the subject, I do spoil the series and or franchise leading up to this particular entry. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam-pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. I got this either as a present or I got it on discount, so I did not pay very much money for this and am thus not bitter on account of that. PCMs, Colonial Marines. Aliens, Colonial That's that's right. There are aliens in this game. Keep forgetting that. When an incomplete signal from Hicks is received by marines the a, a unit is sent to investigate and aid any survivors of the events of James Cameron's aliens and once you know you you get to the Sulaco almost immediately and there is actual drama there and you actually kind of care although part of it might be that you know the movie the, the game is using a lot of what we know from the movies especially the second one and as such you know there is some you know it is it, it gets the, the benefit of, you know, all the, the passion that those films built up for us. But even when it's stuff that's specific to this game, some of the characters and some of the events, you actually do kind of care. Now, you arrive on the USS Sephora, which I believe is like the same class of ship as the Sulaco. Which also does mean that it's not, quote-unquote, just. It's not only set in, you know, the locations of the second film. Now, this is... This is set after the events of Alien 3 and brings them up and... You know, the moment that you have a sequel to that movie, the, the ending loses a lot of its impact. And at least with the fourth movie, it was set so far ahead, you know. But with, yeah, with, with this game, it's like, nope, Ripley did not manage to stop the Xenomorphs for almost 200 years. So, yeah, her sacrifice there at the end was relatively meaningless. And that's not something... I'm not saying you can't further this franchise or that you can't set stories, you know, before the, the fourth movie, between the third and fourth movie or something. But when you... You know, this game didn't have to specifically bring up the third movie. And this is actually the only other than the original Alien vs. Predator game from 99 that's set in the locations that, you know, continuity. You know, the, the second one has, the second AVP game has multiplayer levels that are, you know, settings of the films. But continuity of the movies set in the same locations and such yeah only these two games and that one it was 10 years after you know this one you know how they say in aliens 
you know, how, how long before we, you know, before, before Hudson goes on one of his hilarious, you know, freakouts. We're not going to last 17, you know. They, they say how long bef before they're going to send someone. 17 days. Guess what? It's been 17 weeks. Huh. I guess they misheard. You know, either the Marines or the game developers. Actually, there is an explanation for why it's that long. In in some of the early levels, you know, like I said, they, they encounter the Slaco. So it's we know, we the audience, we the player know what happened, but the characters do not. So as you move through the Slaco, you you know, you know some of what you're going to encounter and you also know what you know, you, you see some things that are in a certain, well, yeah, it's, it's an artist's bullet. You find the the half of Bishop that was left on the Sulaco. And, you know, when you, I mean, they, they, they are aware of, you know, Androids, you know, they, they brought an android on the mission. So it's not like, what is this? But it's, you know, to the player, it means more than to the characters. And then there are things where, you know, you'll find someone slime to all or something, and the player knows exactly what that means. Whereas the characters, you know, they're, they're, it, to them, it's completely foreign. And this is the kind of thing that could be really irritating, but they play it right. Even, even in the first level, the Marines completely go against orders that are given by their superiors. This is, of course, accurate to the film, but it's still kind of annoying. And one of the first ones is actually rendered completely pointless. So, and that was really not something that was at all necessary. They could easily have just written it in a different way. The, you know, as many have pointed out, the plot is not great. The, it's, it's kind of fanfic -y and you can really tell it was written to string these levels together. To, they, they had a bunch of different situations they wanted to put the player in and a list of locations from the film that they wanted the player to visit and the plot just kind of you know stitches that together and it's yeah it's it's not particularly engaging on the whole and you know this is one of the things that they couldn't really you know they 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 tried to fix with patches a bunch of the things in the game that weren't and you know yeah that that weren't particularly good and this is one that they couldn't really do much about they would you know they would have to completely reorganize for it to really yeah when I reviewed the 2010 Alien vs. Predator game, I made the joke that the, the, the Rebellion do not know how to tell a story involving aliens without it being, you know, aliens attack a colony on a whaling yutani owned planet. When I made that joke, I was not aware that this game also takes you to a colony on a Wayland yutani owned planet. The planet from the second movie, no less, and the first movie for that matter, but yeah, that they they legitimately do not know how to yeah. Like like I said in the 
that review, the the second game got by without colonies. It it didn't. Yeah. You know, you want some. You know, some more flavors, or some some different stories told, different locations explored. I am really relieved that this one is not about like a female spy working for William Dutani who needs your help. You know, the the second AVP game did a really great job of that, and then the. 2010 AVP game completely ripped that off. Yeah, thankfully we've gone past that one. And though you in this don't really rescue a female officer who's been face hugged as you do in those, you do rescue a male officer who's been, but then, you know, if it's a game where aliens are a major part which, you know, in spite of the, you know, when, when you look at what enemies you mostly fight, nevertheless, the idea is that aliens are a big part of this, and if there was not a single person encountered that was face-hugged, that you had to, you know, try to rescue or something, yeah, we'd feel like it was missing. And I suppose I shouldn't say whether or not this has the twist of this particular character is, you know, is secretly an android, which is not only in it's it's not technically in the first AVP game, but that's because there are no characters in the first AVP game. But it's in the second AVP game and the 2010 AVP game and three of the four films. Yeah. And the only reason it's not in all four is because in one of those films, it is the, the, the one character who's an android is someone we already met before. It does, of course, have Waylon yutani as a, as a major plot point. Waylon yutani screwing over people and, you know, it's in part, in this it is an extension of it being, you know, a sequel to the second movie, but Nevertheless, Wayland yutani screwing over people is in every AVP game and this, and as far as I've been able to tell from what very little I know about the Alien Isolation game, apparently it's in that as well, although I've otherwise heard incredibly good things about that. It's also in three of the four films, and the only reason it's not in all four is because Waylon yutani doesn't even exist in the fourth one. Again, just let's let's try to go somewhere new. It's just, you know, I... When the first one did it, it was because everything the first one does is just trying to appeal to the films, and there's, there's a lot of fun to be had with the first game, but it's, you know, I already did a review of that. The second game is actually trying to build on the films and try to establish this universe. And yes, it uses Wayland Yutani in doing so, but yeah, it's it's not. Yeah, it just it uses that without and and it goes some new places that we hadn't seen before. The but but yeah this this is trying to be a sequel to the second movie unlike the third movie although I do respect that the third movie was in tone trying to be closer to the first movie and 
as such, yeah, a sequel to the second movie wasn't going to make a lot of sense for that. It does also try to be the second movie, similar to how parts of the 2010 AVP game tries to be the first AVP movie. The plot is actually written by, like, Battlestar Galactica, right, you know, I have not watched that. I watch surprising little sci-fi. Star Trek is almost the only, like, franchise where I, I... I don't watch a lot of TV series in general, so... I've heard tons of good things about that, and... Like I said, sometimes you really care about the plot and the characters, so I do think that it shows, so, so to say, so to speak, that... You know, this this wasn't just someone pulled off the street. This was someone who can actually write. And I think parts of, you know, some of what hurts it is that, like I said, it's it's the plot is to stitch together these things that they wanted to make sure were in the game. And I feel like that was probably the limitation put on, you know, I forget if it's more, more than one Battlestar Galactica writer, but you know, the the writing crew were given this list that they had to work within the confines of, and, yeah, they did a pretty good job considering that, and, you know, another thing is, of course, voice acting, and just the way the, the game treats marines that aren't your character. It's just, it's difficult to care that much about what happens to the characters when they aren't in danger in the levels. I'm not saying that escort missions are... We all hate it, escort missions, obviously, but... Although I, do, I hate them less than others, but nevertheless. I'm not saying that it would have been great for a lot of the game to be escort mission stuff, but... Yeah, really, as, as many others have said, I wish that there just wasn't... That, that you weren't paired up with others for so much of it. I, I would prefer that you just walked around alone and then occasionally would encounter these characters or would be in a position where you had to communicate with them, similar to what AVP2 does. You know, in, in AVP2, it's, it's almost self-parody. Once you get control of the character as a Marine, you know, you're told, okay, go open that door. Okay, go through that door. You go through the door, immediately things collapse behind you, and you, oh, I guess, well, they can't come with you. You still have a mission to do. It looks like you're on your own. Go ahead. But that works. You know, you're. that means that the next time you encounter the characters, or when you hear them over the radio, it matters. You're not just constantly chit-chatting and the characters aren't just there. You you feel like, you know, you're told, okay, well, you can still hear us, so this is important. If you don't do what we've told you you're supposed to do, we are all dead. That's just, that's the way it is. So it's important that you do, you know, okay, weight on my shoulders. That's, you know, it's, it's a single player game and a first person shooter that you want it to be important. And yeah, you go through the game and, and in this, you know, it's still, they find ways to make it that it's stuff you have to do. You know, you're the one running around flipping switches and whatnot, but there's so often someone there and they don't really die. I'm not, I'm going to get more into that, but yeah, it just, it, it really lessens the effect. And did I also, I may not have mentioned, but the voice acting can be atrocious. And that also means that the characters don't have the impact that they otherwise could. The... You will go to the the derelict ship and the surface of LV-426. Let's 
somehow there are xenomorphs on the Solaco with not really, you know... Actually, I suppose that might also be explained. Yeah. Some of these things are explained, but the explanations feel like justifications. It's because the again they want you know they wanted to run around on Solaco shooting xenomorphs. So yeah, you know. So did the the first AVP game. They put you on a different ship so that you know they didn't have to come up with justifications. And the and I, I will say that the the levels on the Solaco and the Sephora are not too similar to the really well done level on the in in the AVP one game, which yeah, as as that game comes to a close, and it's the second to last level, as that game comes to a close it really cranks up the the difficulty but in a way that it's not like actually that's something that this game th this game very near the end has this insane difficulty spike i it, yeah but that game cranks up the difficulty but in a way that works compared to the earlier yeah you know i i said that it's not a masterpiece i have played it through like a dozen times or something. I I owned I've owned it since '99, so it's not like I, you know. And this game was actually canon right up until the moment that the reviews came in. Then they they backpedaled on that one. Though I do, I could definitely see how they could use this in some, you know, there there are making more alien movies, you know, in addition to Prometheus sequel, and yeah, there's definitely some stuff in this game that they could build on that, yeah. And, you know, I already mentioned you, you go to the Derelict, you go to LE426 Surface, you go to Hadley's Hope, they're all recreated very nicely. They very, excuse me, very accurately. Although, you know, how the colony survived the, the core explosion, even if you're going to say, oh, but it didn't really go critical, it's still pretty ridiculous. Again, justification. They they wanted the player to walk around Hadley's Hope. And you know, I, I think the game would have fared better if it just kind of admitted, yeah, this doesn't really make sense, but we really want you to be in this this and this location. This, that's that's basically what the first AVP game did. And yeah. The dialogue is okay, but yeah, not not any better than that. I believe the yeah the first level actually has you crawling for several meters against the vacuum of space. It's absolutely ridiculous. You know, you're you're, you're being pulled out and somehow still crawling in. Yes, I know that Ripley managed, you know, that basic thing at the very end of Aliens, but for one thing, that was kind of ridiculous, too. You know, the, the endings of the Alien movies all get pretty ridiculous. But then, at least in that, it was like a meter and a half or something. But yeah, obviously, when the Queen is grabbing onto her and somehow she's holding on. Yes, that is ridiculous. But you know, they, they also they didn't have to do that in this just because it's in the movie. But in this, it's for several meters. At the end of the day, whenever it's when when a movie or a video game or something like that is 
you know, has reached its end, ultimately you should be left with some feeling that you, you know, you, you're glad that you went for it. You're, you're, you know, you feel satisfied in some way. Yeah, overall, I would say I feel satisfied by this. It delivered about what I had expected from reviews and such, and, you know, at time, at times, in spite of itself, it is fun. You know, it's, I, I enjoyed playing this game almost the whole way, and that, you know, in spite of how bad it is at parts. Now, as I, you know, as the recording stated at the start of this video, unless I forgot to put it in, I did get this on sale, and I do want to specify not only the core game, but all of the DLC as well. And, you know, of course, on Steam, you can't currently buy just the game. It comes with the DLC, but, you know, so so it's not like I had that much of a choice in the case of the DLC. I'll, I'll get into whether or not the DLC is, is worth it. If you're watching this, you know, I will be putting in the, yeah, by the time you're able to watch this, I will have put time codes down in the description box for such things, su subjects such as the DLC. I, I will go through them one by one and go into whether or not they're, yeah. But, yeah, as such, I didn't really have that much of, you know, a choice on whether or not I wanted the DLC since I bought it through Steam. I suppose I could have bought it through EB Games, but I lack the self-loathing to they have anything to do with that store. In research for this, as research for this, I rewatched every movie involving aliens. You know, all four, the entire quadrilogy and both ABP movies. And I played all the AVP games, including expansion packs, again. Yes, I replayed the 2010 AVP game for this. You see how dedicated I am to these reviews. And in and, and as part of that, I also rewatched all the DVD extras. And yet again, it's it's. I actually I forget each time, but. Every single, you know, afterwards, I forget, but every single time I listen to the commentary track, you know, there, there are two commentary tracks for the first AVP movie, and the second one for that matter, you know, director and maybe some actors, and then the special effects guys. The director one on the first movie includes Lance Henriksen, and there's this... There's this part relatively early in the movie and as such the commentary where Lance just basically out of the blue just says, you know, the Democrats have made it seem like everyone who has money is evil. And there's this delicious, awkward silence where Paul W. S. Anderson, and I don't say this often, but poor Paul W. S. Anderson tries desperately to rack his brain to find some way to deal with just how fiercely political the commentary track has gotten in the span of just a few seconds, just out of nowhere. And then it's like, you know, I, I realize, oh, that's right, Lance Henriksen is conservative. And then he goes on to say, I don't think that Wayland is a bad guy. And and that's the confirmation. This person who endangers, you know, he doesn't know about the extraterrestrials, but nevertheless endangers 
dozens of people's lives to feed his own ego, that's not an evil person? There you go. Lance Henriksen is definitely a Republican. Yeah. The the other games, you know, the 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 AVP games, of course, when you talk about their length, you do have to take into account that they all have three different campaigns in the one game. You know, even even Primal Hunt, the, the expansion pack for the second game, has three campaigns. They're they're tiny, but Nevertheless, none of them just have the one, but the marine campaign of each of those basically ranges between an hour and a half and two and a half hours. This game, the, the main campaign, is six hours long, and Stasis Interrupted is two and a half. Combined, the you know the the single player experience of this is actually just just exactly longer than the marine single player experience of the AVP games combined. And if you don't take stages interrupted, then the AVP games combined marine campaigns are just a little longer. You know, like two hours long or something. Not not that much longer than the main campaign. If you only buy the core game, you know, six hours, and that is more than all of them combined. And yeah, that's that's not bad. And unlike the you know, to a greater extent than the second game and closer to the second AVP game and closer to the other two AVP games this is very visceral experience. There's no real, like, you know, it never really, like, pulls back and, you know, and then there's this, and then there's maybe a time jump, and then there's, you know, in this, it's all, you know, the, the game starts, and from there on out, basically, you know, if, if a while passes, it's because you've literally, like, passed out. It's not going to do a time jump, which... You know, the, the Marine campaign itself doesn't do that much in AVP2, but, you know, the other ones, like, in, in the Xenomorph campaign of AVP2, there's literally this part where it's just, and then some time passed, because, you know, the, the alien player character has done what, you know, it needs to at the very start, and then some time passes, and then it comes back into the action once the other two have kind of entered the action, and... Yeah, it's. I love that game, but I will say that this has more of a more of an impact. You play as a generic, you know, no personality marine, and you know, yeah, nothing surprising there, although in this, unlike the 2010, 2010 game, you do actually have a voice. And the amount of times you'll say something particularly interesting is slim to nil. You know, really, there, this and the, the AVP games, there is no compelling human protagonist. You know, there are compelling human characters, but they're all antagonists. You play as Winter, and your officer, you know, in, in charge is named Cruz. He, he keeps things under control. Cruz control. They look way too similar to each other. And in several cutscenes, especially very early on, they are face to face at times, and it's like, wait, which which is which, you know? And they and and their dialogue feeds right into this, you know, talking about you know, I you know, there's something on here. I feel like we might be twins. Anything you see, you you know, you you pass on to me, which I don't think is going to be difficult because I'm pretty sure we're the same guy. Thankfully, the subtitles do 
say, you know, the yeah, when, when you're reading the subtitles, it always says the name of the character speaking before the line itself. The lip sync can be really, really bad. And I mentioned, you know, the, the awful voice acting. This is another thing that would be difficult to fix with patches because they'd have to bring in the cast, you know, or a different cast for that matter. You know, they'd have to bring in people and re-record and yeah. Now this has you know some returning cast from the second film. Henriksen plays you know another bishop model as well as I suppose I shouldn't he plays more than one character. Let's you know and that's of course because Lance Henriksen does not turn down the role of a, a bishop or a Wayland in this franchise, regardless of how terrible the script might be. You know, it's at at this point, you know, it's two bad film roles and two bad game roles. You spend some time just walking around with Bishop, other times you'll contact, you know, communicate over the radio. And something I do appreciate about this is, since your character has a voice, you will actually respond when radio, you know, that's another self-parody thing about the start of AVP2's Marine campaign. The moment things collapse behind you, you know, are, actually it might not be right away, but very early on, they're like, his radio might be broken. He can't answer us, but he might be able to hear us. So let's keep, you know, feeding him information because first person shooters, you know, especially back then, didn't really like to give the player character a voice. You know, there's, this is why Gordon Freeman doesn't speak a single word in the entirety of the first Half-Life game. You know, I'm, I know. I haven't played the second Half-Life game. I, I might get to it at some point. The, but but you know, in this, since you have a voice, Winter actually does respond. So yeah, and and sometimes you know they'll work out what should we do, what is you know, what course of action. Yeah. The and you know I'm also I am relieved that this is Wayland Utani, not just Wayland's corporation, so we don't have to see that dumbass W logo that Paul W. Anderson designed designed for the first AVP movie. It's just even if you don't know what it's supposed to look like. Just looking at that W, you can tell that something's missing because it's not like they just had these two letters and just smacked them together. Someone sat down and designed that so it look so it would look like a logo. You can't just take part of a logo out and say it's a new logo. Because it was before the, the Y joined in. And of course they just had to because you know logos are like Legos. You just keep plugging new things into it and that's how that works when you get new yeah and they actually they recast Bill Paxton in this I I guess he didn't want in but just there is entirely too little B Pax in this and the I, I, I'm not going to give away exactly how you meet him, but you, I mean, I've, yeah, I've already mentioned, you know, Hicks is there at the very start. He sent this, you know, incomplete signal, so, yeah, you know, they're not going to bring in Michael Bean to do two lines of dialogue for this signal. You know, if they're going to bring him back, they're going to give him something, you know, and really, it's not at all spoiler to say so. He's a major part of the Stasis Interrupted DLC. So, yeah. 
he, you know, Michael Bean, this nice, amiable guy, hated doing this, you know, yeah, this this game, the not you know and and it's not at all like he really loved being in the movie you know again listen to the commentary tracks you know and he doesn't have a, at all have a problem with revisiting this character but he said you know it was clear that they didn't really care it was soulless business like so you know and, and by comparison he loved doing Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon and it also that really shows he's clearly having the time of his life doing that but yeah since he didn't really yeah he he's since admitted to only giving a half-hearted performance because of that and it really kind of kind of really shows in the performance you really and and that kind of that affects everything that he said and again he's a major part of stays interrupted so for all of stays interrupted whenever you hear him you can just tell he does not want to be there and it just it really does sour a lot of yeah And the this this tries to explain how Hicks, you know, I already mentioned that, you know, this takes place after the third movie, and Hicks has some kind of role. So obviously, he's alive in spite of what the third movie said, and they do actually explain this in in stasis interrupted they even show it happen but it's still a really far-fetched and awkward way to bring his character back and again it's like i get it i get that you want but just you have to accept you know you, you gotta work with what you've got instead of just trying to contort to to yeah it just it really doesn't like hypothetically i suppose if you know i mean we see at the very end of aliens that they're getting to the, the pods and then we see you know in the third movie that only ripley survived the pods you know maybe something Actually, I suppose, yeah, that is that is close to what they did anyway. It was never going to be particularly smooth when they tried to bring him back. And, you know, it was basically just, as they actually do also do, you know, let you play as, you know, or at the very least have a Hicks clone character, you know, as they do in yeah really the there's a I suppose not really in the in the first AVP game but in the other two and in the second game you even play as the Hicks clone as you basically do here so yeah the you know and also yeah, like I said, you know, the Hicks is still alive in spite of the third film. Newt? You mean the eight-year-old who saw her whole family murdered, lost this entirely colony of over 100 people, and just barely survived until the end of the second film? Yeah, she's, she's still dead. She's still the one getting carved up at the yeah in the third movie yeah again they really didn't need to bring up these characters they could have just worked with what they had just leave the third movie alone leave the real Hicks alone and just you know do like that that predator comic where it's like okay 
you know, there's it doesn't really make a lot of sense that I want to say his name is Dutch, you know, Ar Arnie's character in the first Pirate movie, that he would be in this particular situation. So he has a brother, you know, the, that almost was the, the, you know, Arnie was supposed to be in the second Pirate movie in order to tie them to, together, you know, but yeah, just, you know, oh, he had a, he had a brother, dude, do an avatar, he had a twin brother. You know, that, that way you could say, it's, I mean, it's practically out of James Cameron's pen. He, he wrote a character who had a twin that, yeah, you know, a badass soldier who had a twin. So that once the, the main one died, they had another one, yeah. This doesn't particularly have a Ripley clone. It does have a Vasquez excuse me, and a Spunkmire. I know when they wrote the name for that character, that word didn't mean what it does today. It just meant, ah, oh, she's got she's got guts, she's got spirit, you know, she she doesn't you know, she's got attitude and she doesn't take anything from anybody, but yeah, today it's really unfortunate. There's a bit of a Hudson who doubles as a bit of a Drake. One thing this really gets is the camaraderie between the, yeah, you know, it, it really, you know, much like the the second AVP game, but in this, you know, they, they speak a lot more, you know. In part, you spend a lot more time with them and like I said, it's, you, you know, yeah, you, you spend more time with them in the levels. And it's also just, it's, you spend more time playing this than you do the Marine campaign of Eleanor's Prayer 2. So, you know, yeah, they, they, there's a lot more dialogue and yeah, they, they really get it. And we again have badass female characters and yeah, you know, they kick as much ass as the male ones, but yeah, they, they really, you know, the, the, the banter and this kind of dry wit, I, I do feel like they often push it just one line too far, ending on kind of a sitcom, you know, punchline, but yeah, you know, the first level ends with the Spunkmeyer stand-in, you know, and just in general pilot, basically just crashing the dropship, just barely making it into the, you know, the the port area or whatever it's called of the this big ship, you know, and it kind of, you know. Skids, it it go, you know, the the outer, you know, the the hull of it, you know, scratching right up against the the metal of the inside of the ship, and just barely stops short of crashing into the control chamber that you're in. And right after this, the pilot, you know, with just completely deadpan, without missing a beat. Be advised, actual winters made me scratch my favorite ship, and it's you know spot on. That's that's totally you know. I mean that's that's you know in the film you've got you know Hicks falling asleep because the combat you know the the drop is so you know they're they're so they're so calm during all of this, and they're making these quips and such, and yeah you know. But then right after, Winters replies, it's your only ship. Yeah. Another one is that, you know, the, the, there's been this big, like, explosion and, like, you know, the, the Marines got, like, thrown, you know, at least a few meters in, in one of the ships. And one of them is, like, status. 
and another replies, ouch. Yeah. And the, the, then, you know, they're like, okay, distance to target. And then the other responds, in meters or in things trying to kill us. Again, pretty, pretty good. But then the other one responds, oh, about the same. Just, yeah. Now, the, there isn't really a major xenomorph character that you're supposed to recognize, you know, other than, like, you know, boss fight, kind of, yeah, the, the ones that are specifically for, yeah, but, you know, if they, if they were going to, I'd like to think that they'd go closer to Grid, or, I know, some call him Nethead, than Six, you know, Grid from the first ABP movie, yes, it's stupid that the acid blood goes through the the net, but, you know, it's a Paul Douglas Anderson movie. They're full of stupid, frustrating elements. Every single time after that that you see Grid, it's like, right, that was that one, because, you know, in addition to the net, you know, he actually does something compelling and so every time you see him after that it's like oh it's that one again we know that he's really capable and yeah you know and then in 2010 avp game it's just that they put a six on the forehead of the xeno because they were testing on it and every time you see it after that where you're supposed to recognize it you see the six and it's just it's such a lazy boring thing you know grid He's, like, scarred from battle. He's got something to avenge. You know, six is just, you know, how are we supposed to tell these apart? Put a number on them. You know, just that's, that'll be. Sometimes these characters make really stupid decisions. This was delayed several times. You know, like, they were talking about it in, like, 2001, so, you know, back then it would basically have had to compete with the second AVP, you know, then in 2006, 2008, and then finally it came out here, although supposedly at least one of those versions was just a different game, you know, just with the same name or some of the same ideas or whatever. This is one of the only Gearbox games that I've played, although apparently they, you know, outsourced a lot of it, but, you know, really the only other stuff than this is Opposing Force, Blue Shift, and Counter-Strike, so, you know, that's an okay track record, but, you know, I, I realize that they've done a lot of great stuff, I just haven't played it. When this came out, this was one of the worst games ever. That's, yeah. I mean, even if you, even if you ignore the license, the, all the expectations and the budget, the price, still absolutely terrible game. That's, yeah. But thankfully, since then, you know, they, they went on a bug hunt. And they fixed a lot of the, you know, the, the biggest problems that they could fix. You know, one of the, the big things that was criticized was the terrible and even you know, right, broken AI, but, which is largely fixed. Now it's just, it's okay and at times really good. And will occasionally break. There were times where enemies would attack the air after I turned a corner. Like, it's not that they're shooting above me or next to me. They're, they're shooting at a place I was several seconds ago. It's, there's, there's no way that they would possibly hit me, you know, or enemies will just stop moving or, yeah, just various, but you know, considering it was it was a very small percentage of the time that that happened. You know, the 
the graphics, as far as I know, have been improved since then. Now the... I watched Bennett the Sage's review of this and Angry Joe's review, both when this first came out and rewatched in preparation for playing and reviewing. But yeah, I will go through the various things, the, the various aspects of the game one by one and you know, go into how how good they are and such. I am aware that Templar GFX has done a mod that, as far as I understand, fixes every major issue that was left to fix. And I there are a few reasons that I did not play this mod. In part, I don't really like to use mods for games that weren't made specifically you know, yeah, in, in part made so that you could use mods for them. You know, when I reviewed Killing Thorn Rack, I had played mods because those are literally made for mods. You know, that you, know, you don't have to play mods, but if you are at all considering doing so, the game is, has, you know, the, the modding, you know, yeah, it's, part of the game is specifically built to allow you to easily use mods. And, you know, I also just didn't really... You know, one thing is, I... If I sat down and I had the instructions and such, I could probably get it to work. But not everyone is going to, and some people are going to play it, you know, I play this on PC, but you know, if you play it on a different console, I'd still like most of what I say here to be relevant. So, yeah. But I do really appreciate that, you know, some really talented people are trying to save these games that still kind of need it. That's, yeah. The... I have only played the fixed version of this, and if it hadn't been fixed, I probably would not have played it. I try to avoid games that I genuinely expect to be bad, and especially ones that are, you know, declared broken. Now, and, and I will be reviewing it based on what it is like today. So, you know... For, for people who are, like me, going to play it a while after it came out, and after it's been largely fixed. I understand enjoying a bad movie. You know, in a... In a yeah, you know, not thinking this is good, but like, you know, laughing at how inept it is. But to enjoy a bad game, you know, the it has to be bad in ways that don't make it just like frustrating to play. You know, the the since it's so much more active and interactive of an experience, you know, if it's like writing, acting, AI being bad in that, you know, it makes it the game too easy or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, if, you know, I've played quite a few bad games that are just frustrating to play. And I kind of, the moment I start playing something, I want to finish it. I don't want to, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to play something for a little while and then not finish it. I, I, I don't, I try not to start something that I can't finish. Now, while the, the, the 2010 AVP game was just okay and AVP2's 
expansion pack Primal Hunt was downright bad. Really, AVG, AVP have been pretty good so far. I'm, I'm talking about games, not movies. Movies are terrible. I've heard this game referred to as like Duke Nukem Forever. I'm, I'm one of the, the lucky ones that have not played that game, but yeah, that's, yeah, and I've heard that Dead Space 3 is better than this, I've only played the first Dead Space, so I can't say, and if you pre-ordered this, if you got this at like full price, back when it was broken, you have my sincerest sympathies. Now, of course the game, you know, does have apologists and did from right away, you know. Sure, this game has a ton of bad qualities, but the... You know, it's, it really has a lot to live up to after, you know, this game came out in 2013, you know, it's, it's especially appealing all from, you know, it's, it's for fan, the, the fans of the second movie, you know, so, you know, 27 years of hype whether or not you you know not everybody has been hoping for a you know and and other alien games have been made in the time between of course but yeah the moment that you have a game like this yeah now the you know and and just in general excuse me the the game is you know standing on on the shoulders of, of giants it's it's trying to live up to this this immense weight of expectation of you know these classic and deservedly beloved films and and then three and resurrection the 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 authenticity is deeply impressive it this really captures the look sound and feel much like avp2 did and you know it recreates a number of settings and adds new ones some of them are just new areas of you know areas of the solaco that you didn't see or areas of hadley's hope and such and they fit Now, to an extent, this kind of wastes the license. There are countless homages, references, fan service, and such, and some of it is, yeah, pretty pretty silly. Now, as others have noted, you know, even now that it's fixed, it boils down to a bland quarter shooter, a very linear first-person shooter, and there are much better ones out there. Some, you know, compare this to Call of Duty, and I haven't played Call of Duty, but usually when people compare something to Call of Duty, it's they're saying that Call of Duty is bad. So, yeah. And I can understand, you know, from what I do know about Call of Duty, yeah, this seems like a lot like Call of Duty. You know, you might almost call it Call of Duty with Xenomorphs. Although there are more PMCs than Xenomorphs. And so it's just Call of Duty in the Aliens universe. It ends up as just kind of a an okay cover shooter since yeah there are 
simply more, you fight more PMCs than Xenomorphs. There is, you know, an occasional item hunt. The, the developers said that, you know, it's basically either you're doing a gauntlet run, which is like, you know, you're fighting your way from point A to point B, similar to Left 4 Dead, or it's like a last stand kind of thing where you're defending an area, you know, setting up turrets, welding doors shut. So, you know, like Left 4 Dead with Contagion or Killing Floor style, you know, welding or boarding. You know, and both of these do fit the alien, you know, both the creature alien and the alien franchise. Unlike the 2010 game, this does have down the sight aim, and, and the 2001 game, but that was before, and the 99 game, those were before down the sight aiming. And you can crouch, sprint. You never get to control an APC, you know, drive around an APC or use the the gun of an APC, you know, man the gun. You never get to fly a drop ship or man its guns. Actually, hold on. Wasn't there one point where I'm APC? You, you do man at least one gun of like a uh, is that just of the ship and anyway you you certainly never get to drive a vehicle you get at least you know you get more than one look inside of a drop ship and unlike the ones you see in you know the, the first avp or the second avp it actually looks like it could you know, like it could run, like like it's something that works in the real world. It's not just empty inside. You know, which in in the second game especially gets super awkward in the multiplayer level, where you can spend as much time as you want just looking up inside of it. And, and there's some single player levels where you can also just look up inside of them. And yeah. The and the the pulse rifle looks really great in the first person shooter view, like the original and the 2010 AVP games, but unlike AVP 2, and it's still not you know the, Hicks says remember short control bursts, it's you know that's not best. It's definitely not needed in this. I I still hope that they at some point do a game where you have an, a where you have a pulse rifle and that actually that line is accurate but yeah I do really really like the reload animation for the pulse rifle it's much more alive and fluid than in the three AVP games where they they're just so afraid to move it from the lower right side of the the screen, you know, of, of the first person perspective, and it just, yeah, it it feels like they there's it's it's almost neurotic, like they think that it it will look bad if they put it in any other part of the you know of the screen, and in this it. It looks like, you know, it, it reloads in an animation that can take up a lot of the screen, similar to, you know, lots of first-person shooter animations. And just in general, it, it looks like a gun. It looks like it could work. You know, they, they slightly redesigned some of the look of it, and it helps immensely. I, I definitely have to say, this is my favorite looking and reloading animation Thing of the pulse rifle in any of these games. The the pulse.
pulse rifle grenade is this, you know, it's not a, the small explosion that it is shown to be in the, the second movie, it's the big explosion of the AVP games. And you can, you know, the, the shotgun or guns in this may also allow throwing, you know, a grenade launcher, but they don't share ammo, although it's a very similar grenade that they throw. So, yeah, that's, that's appreciated that, you know, if you are running around with a shotgun and you want to launch a grenade, you can now do that through, yeah. And if you run out of pulse rifle grenades, but you want to throw grenades, you know, maybe you switch to the shotgun, but then if you want to fire the pulse rifle, switch back. Yeah. The, the smart gun, again, you know, follows enemies on screen like the AVP games. And it does not, you know, kind of allow seeing enemies through walls the way that the 2010 game did. You only use it for minutes in, in this, in the single player. I heard one review say 10 minutes. I'm almost certain it was less for me. It's basically, you, you can't really reload it. So when you find it, you use it for a while and then it runs out of ammo. There are other guns like this in the game and for those it can be a little annoying, but the smart gun, you know, anybody who's watched the movie wants to, you know, wants to fire a smart gun. Um, you know, if, if it wasn't in the game at all, that would probably be more frustrating, but nevertheless. It is a lot of fun to use. It's, it is my favorite smart gun. Yeah, of, of you know, if, if I only get to fire a smart gun for a few minutes, then it's definitely this smart gun that I want to be firing. And, and I do want to note, it's a fun gun to use in every single one of these games. But it does feel like the, the developers here, they, they played the other games a bunch of times, and they were like, this is how we improve on these things. You know, like, like I said, Pulse Rifle and Smart Gun, in a lot of ways, better. The... The shotgun looks a lot like the one in the movie. Basically, every gun that is in the movie is in this, and then, you know, even those grenades that you see them, you know, the, the little, you know, almost looks like a pen, and then they put take the cap off, and, yeah, you know, that's that's actually here, and... I'm almost certain that hasn't been in any of the other, in, in any of the AVP games. Now, it has been noted that it's kind of a vanilla weapon lineup. lineup. And the, you know, I, I should briefly compare you know, I am replaying the, you know, the the hilariously long series title. I suppose, yeah, by then they had stopped calling it Dark Forces. So technically it is just called Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Outcast or Jedi Outcast for short, or Jedi Knight 2 for short. Yeah, replaying that these days, solid game, by the way. And I'm not saying that, you know, obviously Star Wars, the Star Wars universe, compared to the Aliens universe, far more open for these far-out science fiction-y guns, but 
nevertheless you know i mean when you when you just look at the movies you know if if you were you know as has been done a number of times now if you were designing a first person shooter based on the star wars movies there's not that much that you're like left with for you know okay you've got the you've got the blaster pistol the stormtrooper rifle the wookie bowcaster there's not an awful lot you know the the thermal detonator of course which hilariously i love that in the movies it's not clear if it's like if if what Leia is doing, if that's like an insane threat, or if C-3PO is just being over-anxious, as he so often is. But, depending on the game, you know, it's it's a regular grenade, basically, in the, you know, Jedi Knight Dark Forces series. In the licensed game for Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, very appropriately named Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. It's a small nuke, but anyway, yeah, you know those are the weapons that. Okay, you know obviously they're going to be in the game, but what else do you do? And yeah, here are a few examples of what they came up with. That you know, again, just briefly, I'm not saying that these exact weapons would fit. I'm saying that. It's a first-person shooter, and there are standards to be met. You know, you, you expect something from a first-person shooter. You expect at least ten guns that are different. And in this, yeah, I'll get more into what is in this, but briefly, what's in that? You know, you've got the, the blasters, you've got the grenade and such. Then you have this instant-hit energy sniper that literally disintegrates what it hits. You've got, you know, the, the Wookiee Bowcaster, when it fires, it can have the projectiles deflect off walls so you can shoot around corners. You know, you've got a, you know, a, a mobile machine gun. You know, you've got energy blasts with an area of effect you know, yeah, every thing. You know, you've got a gun that shoots these kind of electrical blasts. You can, you know, throw the thermal detonators so that they bounce a few times before they explode. You know, it's got an RPG which can actually lock on to enemies before firing. You know, proximity mines remote detonated explosives in addition to of course the the lightsaber and such and you know honestly in this game most guns just fire bullets and you know some grenades and stun projectiles that can come in handy and then you know the DLC add others but if you don't play those then that's all and even with it's not it's not that much and it yeah it needed to be the the the, the new game the, the new guns that are in this that aren't in the, the movies or the other games and such do fit the the universe here. It it really is a lot like they just went through. You know what what would a soldier have? And yeah. And this also allows finding legendary guns, which are generally the guns you see characters use in the film. And you know they've got the graffiti and markings that it's, yeah, just like in the the films, so they're completely recognizable by that. Now, the I suppose I shouldn't give away how many. It's if you want to know, it's not difficult to find out how many legendary guns there are and how many are in 
different levels and such. And I something that's well worth noting about these legendary guns that I wasn't sure of before playing their status their stats their stats vary from the, the regular ones. So even with you know upgrading your own guns, the the legendary guns, they're not just ooh, they look like the ones in the films. No, they actually have stats that mean using them can be more useful than some of the other guns and yeah and when you found them in the single player campaign you can use them in multiplayer as well so it's well worth replaying for and it's not difficult when the moment you start playing a level you can just you know Look up your stats, you know, hold down tab, and it'll say, ha, you know, you have or you have not found the legendary weapon in this level, and the legendary weapon you're looking for is this particular weapon. So, yeah, you know, it's, you're, you're not going to be running around like, wait, what am I looking for, and where am I looking for it? You know, the again, you, if I recall... Yeah, you, you can't actually see just looking, you know, you can see which ones you found, but you can't see which levels you haven't found them in without going into those levels. But, you know, there's a mission selector, so if you're going to replay f to find those guns, you know, just check them real quick. Like I said, the moment you get control of the character, just hold down tab and you'll see, have or have not found, this is what you'd be looking for if you are looking for it. And I, I do wish that, you know, that you could see these stats when you're running around in single player. You can only see them when you go to the multiplayer loadout editing in the menu. That, that's the only place you can see the status of the legendary ones. You know, even though you can upgrade your main ones in single player as well. So it would make sense. Again, if, if they completely separated it, if upgrading was purely for multiplayer, which I think would be fair to do, then, you know, okay, then it's, of course, only for... then I could more understand it, but you're running around the main game and, yeah, you know, once you found a few you know, I was running around with three different pulse rifles, and it's like, which one is, you know, which one should I use? And, yeah, I mean, I, I guess maybe you just have to memorize what the status is of one of those, and, you know, before you can, you know, yeah, once you've completed the level where you found it, or if you just, you know, get to another checkpoint, and then jump out of the campaign, go into the menu, read it, and then jump back in, and, you know, that's a way, but they could very easily have have put it in. The basically the in in multiplayer you can only carry the the three gun, you know, the You've got the, the primary weapon, the secondary weapon, and then the pistol. In single player, you can run around with all of the guns at the same time. And, you know, the DLC ones, you don't even have to find before you can start using them. As, as far as I know, I, I only realized several levels in that I had all of them. I thought that I only had primary, secondary, and pistol, but, yeah the you know basically there are two shotguns one sub submachine gun one rifle two assault rifles and then three pistols and then the legendary weapons are other versions of those and you know different with different stats and the DLC are added onto that and the DLC one I'll co I'll cover as I cover the DLC in general
I really like the when you load the shotgun you loaded one shell at a time but you can stop it at any time if you need to fire off some some shots before you keep reloading or if you need to switch to another weapon you can interrupt it mid reload you're not forced to you know just let it reload all the way before you can do anything else for some reason like in the 2010 game they gave the the pistol infinite ammo and this is so completely pointless now that you can carry so many weapons all the ones I just listed you know without getting into detail before you can carry all of those at the same time so you know and it's not like ammo is just nowhere in the game you can find ammo you can find ammo for legendary guns so yeah I, I really don't know why they decided that with all of that still unlimited you know again if you're talking multiplayer giving the the player a single gun with unlimited ammo I can understand that but you know considering you only have the three guns but yeah in Bennett the Sage's review he says that it's pointless to let you turn off the light on the gun, the flashlight. I don't think he played multiplayer because multiplayer is very stealth driven. Yeah. Where, you know, like, like in the 2010 AVP game, the moment you give unlimited ammo to the pistol, you know, the, the pulse rifle just barely putting a safe distance between you and the xenomorphs that effect is lessened. The the xenomorphs can kill you very fast if they get close to you, so you really wanna keep them. Yeah. The the melee is fairly easy to use, like in the the 2010 AVP game, but unlike there, here it just kind of shoves them back a little. Where in that, it legitimately just knocks them down to the ground, then you can easily finish them off. The you know here here it's basically just giving you breathing room. You can melee with a gun out. It kind of looks the the animation is is awkward in both look and speed. Basically, you hold up the gun for about a second after you know after doing the melee, which you know, before he puts the gun back down, he can't. You can't shoot a melee again. You know, just make the de make the animation more detailed to explain why it takes a while before he can. You know, instead of just leaving it up there for a little. Yeah. Now, like I said, simpler. You can have all of the weapons at the same time. And the only reason, the only way to cycle through them, the only way to switch between anything other than your current primary, secondary, and pistol, is this weapon wheel, which is ridiculously slow. You can't even walk while using it. And it's it's one of these where, basically, whatever you end up pointing at, he'll select as the weapon. When a lot of times I was like looking around okay what are my options okay I guess the the best option I have is already the one I have out and then without really noticing I left the the you know the marker on a different weapon and then I put away the weapon wheel and then he switches to that weapon why not just make it so that you have to actively choose you know press the the fire key in order to select a different weapon, you know. And I have no idea why they don't just let you cycle through them. That's what the mouse wheel is for. The only thing you can use the mouse wheel for in this is just switching between the two guns that you already have out. It's just, it's pointless. It feels like the decision that you could just carry all of them was made at the last minute or something. And then you add to it that there are weapons you know, making it more confusing, there are weapons that you can only carry. You know, I already mentioned the smart gun, then there's this, you know, an RPG, a flamethrower, 
I want to say there's also a grenade launcher separate from the RPG. And all of those, if you pick one of them up, the only way you're going to get to use one of the other guns is by putting that gun back down, which you just do by switching to one of the other weapons. But, yeah, so, you know, that's why I thought that I was stuck with just the one, you know, or the, the two, rather, guns that, yeah. That's another thing, when... In Stasis Interrupted, you start out without any weapons, and then suddenly someone, you know, after a while someone hands you a single weapon, and then suddenly you just have, like, two or three at the same time. You know, instead of just excuse me, t taking a few seconds to just show an animation for each weapon being given to you. You know, it, if you don't count the DLC, it's, or, or legendary weapons, it's six different weapons. Why not just let you cycle through them instead of you having to slowly use the weapon wheel? You know, with DLC, it's nine. You know, and, and it legitimately, you know, I, I looked everywhere in the controls menu. There is not a, you know, an, an entry. You cannot set to a key switching between the weapons in any other way than the weapon wheel. There isn't one that's just called next weapon or previous weapon or something. It's primary, secondary, pistol, and then weapon wheel. Those are the only options. And, yeah, you, you know, I, I, like, like I said, you, you don't run out, you, you never actually run out of ammo in, yeah, in, in single player, it's basically, it's practically impossible to run out of ammo. And, you know, in part, this is because the, you know, these, all these different guns, they don't share ammo, which by itself is a good thing, but... In, in this kind of game, where the whole idea is that you can't just, yeah, you know, and, and even the, the, at no point in, for example, the, the second AVP game, where you also run around with a lot of weapons at the same time, and in the first AVP game, if you're very careful about using ammo and, you know, if, if you never panic, then yes, after, you know, you can, in some levels, build up your arsenal, you know, gradually get more and more guns and then have them all when you, especially when you need them the very most. But, yeah, this is the only of these games where I felt like, well, you know, what's even the point? I don't, I don't have to be careful not to use too much ammunition because there's always going to be more. And again, I, I don't think they could have made this work. I, I really, for a while, this game thought that it was you, you find a different gun and then you swap it. That, you know, yeah, like a lot of current shooters, that you can only carry the two weapons and or a pistol, and then that's it, you know, but yeah, that, that's one option, another is just, well, okay, let's say they do have shared ammunition, so you're choosing which gun to best, you know, some, the, the more powerful guns will use the, the, the shared ammunition faster, you know, then there are other guns that are just very accurate, but, you know, slower, something, but as it is, it's just way too easy in single player. And this, there are four different grenades. And the, the DLC weapons are for both single player and multiplayer. The motion tracker works like the, you know, the, the AVP games and the, 
the the movie as well and in in single player you can hear the the hear it beeping anytime which makes a, a decent amount of sense you know when when you've put it away you haven't turned it off as so you know and you do have to put it away to shoot just like we see in the you know base you know basically you, you can't both look at that and focus on shooting and I'm really glad that they finally did this in a game because that's something that I've felt was missing in the AVP games right from the start and it scans 180 degrees and 20 meters ahead of you and it's very easy to very quickly switch between having the motion tracker out and having a gun out now the and you can sprint with it out although you can't read it while sprinting which again makes a pretty good amount of sense now the objective pointer shows up the moment that you bring out the motion tracker which is a little annoying for those of us who don't want to see the motion tracker the, the objective pointer you know except for when we're like completely lost or something I, I wish that it was just when you held down tab for status you know that's a fairly natural you know because you don't really need that too much of the time you know what your basic mission is and I it is one of those games where if you if you never really check then you're going to get lost a bunch of the time if yeah if you never look at the objective pointer there are times where you have to weld doors shut or blowtorch open doors that have for example been welded shut and you also use the manual override to open sometimes and sometimes other marines will do as well you regenerate health but it's separated into three boxes and basically you can only regenerate the sort of latest box that has it all been dug into so if you're in a fight and you lose an entire box you can't regenerate that box you have to find healing items and that does mean that there are times in the game where if you're not careful you will be running around with just one box of health and that box goes fast when it's your last box so yeah now this does have the you know sentry guns of the, the the film and that are also in you know the first two AVP games but not the you know the the 2010 AVP game gave us what no one wanted a redesign of a turret and this one also gives us a redesign there's just the, there's more than one type of turret in this and again there didn't need to be it's because the other type is Wayland Utanis, and there's no reason that they couldn't use the the same one. Now the you know basically in order to pick an item up like a, a healing item or ammo or such, you have to point to it and press use. You can't just walk over it. I guess this is for co-op where you have to share you can't just one person be running around and taking all of it other than that you know it it's super annoying in single player when you're trying to just grab some ammo or heal or whatever and you know you'd like to be able to turn your back on an item and walk over it so you're shooting at the same time instead of having to carefully point to it and then press use yeah now as Ben of the Sage points out the fact that you get you know experience points and can upgrade by finding you know dog tags and audio logs is 
kind of strange, you know, odd logic. Now the you you can customize your appearance in in multiplayer as well. Excuse me, and you yeah I'll, I'll get to that. Logs are actually fairly good. I mean, they, they do sometimes have the bad acting, but I most of the ones I found worked in, you know, providing some background or some kind of drama or something. And their, you know, diaries or, you know, a call someone made to another person or the like. Unfortunately, they are all these laptops. So, you know, and again, I, I think it's because the, it's trying to fit in with the movie. And the movie was designed by the, the 80s vision of the future. So, you know, they have the, the telephone that can show an image while you're on the phone. But it's this big kind of box that they have, you know, where today, if you want to have a conversation with someone where, you know, you're showing your face as well, you can just use a smartphone. It's not a big, you know, but yeah, in the 80s, laptops were these big blocks that couldn't move. You know, today, I mean, audio logs, you know, again, cell phone, it's, it's, you know, and that's also, that's, that's what I've mostly in, encountered in games are logs that you just, you pick them up and then they're like stored and you can listen to them as you walk. And the problem with them being stationary is you end up spending a lot of time, including in intense situations where you just, you found a log and you want to hear it. So you just, you have to stand still there waiting for it to, you know, in, in the 2010 game, you had to stay in the menu, that at least means the game is paused. In this, the game is not paused. If you want to listen to it, you just have to sit there and wait until it's done before you can rejoin the game. You know, there, there are times where it will be in a specific room and you're supposed to be outside of that room in a major firefight. The you know, the, the various upgrades include laser sight or reflex sight. And, of course, in multiplayer with, you know, you... Actually, I, I never I never did check if laser sight was harder to, you know, to hi harder to hide. But it would make sense, certainly. And, you know, I figure multiplayer is also where the silencer makes sense. Because certainly in single player really doesn't have and also for some reason you know the the you'll your upgrades include stuff like an extended clip or a silencer and such the silencer may make your gun weaker that makes sense that's you know but somehow the extended clip will also make your gun more accurate and it's like Maybe they had to cut down on the amount of upgrades they were going to have overall. And so they had to combine some of them. But otherwise, I mean, sure, an extended clip is all well and good. But overall, I'd really rather have accuracy. So if you're going to explain one of those two things, go for the accuracy one. I, I guess it's because the, you know, the silencer and the extended clip are more kind of visual, you know, everybody knows what it means to have an extended clip, and you can even see it when you upgrade, but, you know, increasing accuracy other than putting a specific sight on, you know, that is something you can do if you modify a gun, but it's not necessarily going to be very visual. The... You can attach a kind of shotgun underneath your pulse rifle instead of a grenade launcher. You can upgrade and swap upgrades in in single player at any time, which is very awkward. You know, suddenly you're 
your gun is just different. You know, basically they should have like upgrade stations, which you know they would have to put in the game. There aren't currently upgrade stations, but you know, yeah, just every so often, you know, you you're passing around all these machines and human technology anyway, so just make some of them upgrade stations. Collectibles you find will be stored as having been found by you in co-op as well. You know, you basically replaying to find collectibles, whether you're replaying in single player or yeah, in co-op. When you when you press status, yeah, you will see which ones you already found, and you don't have to find those again just because you're now playing it in co-op or because you played in co-op now you're playing single player. And I I think they did a pretty good job of making them not too obvious in in where you find them. Like you know you you can find them of course but I, I feel like they they sat down took a look at the collectibles and were like what if I hit you the there's a pretty good amount of customization and you know like I already mentioned some the stats are affected by a lot of these you can customize the look of the Xenomorph as well, and the attacks. I will get more into how you can customize the Xenomorph attacks. Now, the, the Queen is kind of huge, like in the, you know, AVP 1 game. The, the chest bursters aren't as huge as AVP 10, but they are really big. And the tongue is at times twice as long as it's supposed to be like in the, you know, 2007 movie, the, the second AVP movie. The AI is quite stupid. It's a really good thing that there is no friendly fire because your 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 fellow marines will walk directly into your line of fire. They will shoot directly through you to hit enemies. As already mentioned, they cannot die unless it's scripted. And I mean there there were times where I thought, "Oh, no, he's definitely dying," you know. They, they will get knocked down, stay down for minutes, and then just get back up after, even if they've had, like, an alien attack them for a while. Or there, there were other times where I thought, well, you know, I, I don't see them anywhere. They must have died. And then I, you know, proceeded to the next part of the level, and it turned out they had run ahead of me, leaving me fighting by myself. I suppose I should be grateful that they at least waited for me at the next section of the level instead of just running through the rest of it. And you really do not spend enough time alone. You're almost always with at least one fellow Marine. And all of single player. And the radio messaging back and forth is too frequent. But, yeah, like I said, it, you know, it does also mean you're never really defending or doing an escort mission. You know, defending a fellow character. The aliens will sometimes beeline right for you. They might be, they might really slow down once they get close to you. Making them very easy to kill. Which wasn't really true of the... AVP games at any point, they will use, they will often use no strategy, they'll run away from you instead of attacking, they'll pause politely waiting for you to attack, 
around the middle of the game, I did experience a number of enemies that of, of aliens that would zigzag and you know thus make them difficult to target and you know when most of the game when they ran you know on the walls or on the ceiling you know they weren't doing a very good job of it they weren't doing it strategically they were doing it because they could basically and the you know the 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 game never does you know unlike the 2010 AVP game the game never does just you know stop have have you stop in a part of the level and just send xenomorphs at you like you're in a batting cage and they are baseballs the xenomorphs will really pose in cutscenes face huggers are slow and at times don't move at all and like the 2010 AVP you can grab a face hugger and now also a xeno straddling you and they won't kill you as long as you have enough health you know like in primal hunt as well they'll basically drool acid on you while you just, you know keep pressing tapping the use key and as long as you do so before you run out of health they won't hurt they you know they won't kill you the the xenomorphs yet again are you know there are drones warriors runners the queen the face huggers and this adds a few new ones including the crusher which i really wish was more distinct from just the queen basically it's it's bigger than the other aliens. The, the Crusher is nowhere near as big as the Queen, but it's bigger than the other aliens. It's tougher, and that's that's basically it. It's big and strong, uh, and the Crusher is also a little faster than the Queen. But the you know the basic idea is its head is bulletproof, and you know it you you can hurt it in the rest of its body or maybe you you know depending on the situation maybe you need to blow you know blow it up or like use fire to harm it and such but it boils down to a bigger alien that's tougher to take down now in a more interesting variant of the alien is the boiler which basically kamikazes in this acid blood so you know somewhat similar to the left for dead boomer somehow very little gore when it you know explodes in spite of this but yeah it's it's a really cool new version and when you encounter it in single player you're actually weaponless and you're you know moving around under this you know under the floor and you keep encountering these holes that xenomorphs can reach through and not necessarily at every single hole but some of them there definitely will be a xenomorph and it's like if you if you aren't careful they're going to get you and the boiler in single player does not have eyes so it moves entirely by sound so when you get close to it you have to crouch and if it comes very close to you you have to stand still until it leaves and again if you don't do so it will simply explode we're not talking about oh but you'll just run away from it no it will get close to you and it will explode there's no yeah and I actually I really wish that this was how the amnesia the dark descent enemies behaved that you know crouch to sneak by them and stand perfectly still when they're really close to you 
but I, you know, in my review of that, I talk about how the enemies in that work. And in this, they're also the the boilers. They start out standing stock still and looking like husks of like like fossils. So when you first encounter them, you're just looking at all these fossilized, you know, xenos and you, you know, yeah, you move past a bunch of them, and suddenly one of them starts to move, and that's how, you know, not not every single time do you encounter them right by, excuse me, other other ones that are actually fossilized, but yeah, you don't know which will move until one starts moving, and you basically have to lure them by causing noise in these scripted sequences to blow themselves up to so that they don't kill you and yeah it's it's very outlast but with some interesting additions such as the statue with that said if you're going to play one of these two games for that kind of stuff i would still choose outlast over this and then there is the the variant called the Lurker, and if I, I should briefly say the the Boiler is a you know you you can also play in in multiplayer. It's just you you don't select it. You, you know, the the Boiler and the Crusher are both ones you can find these bonus pickups for in multiplayer when playing as Xenomorphs and. Yeah, then you get to play as one for a little while, and they're, of course, tougher to take down for the enemy, for the marines. The, but yes, the, the lurker, it's, it, it's very hard to, to spot, and it's, it is weaker than the regular aliens, but yeah. And, and, and the, power up spawning ones they're also you know you find them somewhere around the map and they're limited in the number of uses and I'm really glad that we now have a an alien that uses acid over distance as an attack you know we we see this somewhat in the Alien Resurrection movie in the first AVP movie and here, you know, the, the, there is some in the 2010 ADP as well, but much, much less than there should be. Here, like in tw the 2010 game, it's the the Xeno called the Spitter, and in this one, it's the it shoots very where it's it's a fast projectile and it's very accurate. You, as a marine, you do see it flying through the air and. You know, if you're fast enough, you may be able to dodge it, but you might be facing dozens of spitters. So, yeah. And the the acid does a lot of damage as well. And the spitters do tend to move very strategically. They are fairly easy to spot in the dark, though, since they glow yellow. So it's, you know... It, it trades stealth for range. And yeah, these Xenomorph variants, they, they feel like they fit in the universe of aliens, similar to how the Queen feels like it fits in the, the universe, in, in, you know, belongs with the, the Xenomorph that we meet in the first movie. That, you know, something that looks like that and acts like that would have a queen that looks like and acts like the one in the second movie. Obviously some people will hate that they add, you know, more aliens and such, and I completely understand, but it is a game you need more than just, you know, you need several different types of enemies. And I am really relieved that we've at least moved past the super face hugger. Now that thing makes no sense. And really, the the 
AVP games did not have enough different enemies. You know, look at any major game where, you know, you're fighting, you know, extraterrestrials and it's not on a license and you'll see there are far more different types. Now, PMCs, they have the dumb look of the, yeah, the PMCs of the third Alien movie, and yeah, they are, you know, I realized that a while into the game, these are the, the guys with guns that you see with Bishop at the end of the third movie. It looked bad in that movie. You know, I guess it's maybe, again, kind of this thing of, you know, previous decades' theories about what the future would look like. But, yeah, they always looked really dumb, and now they're the main enemy of an Aliens game. For, you know, if, if you were wondering, PMC means private military contractor. You know, they're... Pri a private military force that you know works for Will and Yutani, and they're you know trying to. I yeah, I, I shouldn't go into too much detail about what, why they are there. If we're you know, Angry Joe pointed this out. If we're talking about levels that are purely focused. On xenomorphs yeah it's it's basically three levels I'm not gonna give away how many there are total but yeah that's that's not a very big chunk you know there there are other levels where there are also you know there are xenomorphs but then there are also human enemies the the ones where there's purely xenomorphs and you know not boss fights and such three levels but most of the game you spend fighting human beings you know at least in you know in in ABP 10 a number of these were you know like androids but yeah the you know, there, there have been some human enemies for the Marine player in every AVP game, except for the first one, but never this many. If, you know, when, when you... When, when an enemy dies, either it'll be this gore explosion or it'll be just really boring. A lot of the blood looks painted on you know, in in certain games where the graphics aren't great, the you know it'll look like wounds are like just attached to the outside of the body. In this, you don't even get that. It's just it looks like some you know red room, red room over there. The and and that again, you know. That's unlike the AVP games, and those it tends to be, you know, at least some limbs will come off or something. Now, the eggs don't tend to open unless you get close to them, so unlike Primal Hunt and AVP 10, 2010, Unlike the the first AVP game, you know, xenomorphs aren't spawned randomly, but it's nowhere near the scripted and honestly kind of stiff that it gets in AVP 2 when you've played it more than once. You basically know where they are. But, you know, yeah, human, human bad guys are in those games as well. This does a good job of building to the stronger enemies and 
almost never throws too many at you at once. You know, any game can just keep throwing enemies at you to make it more difficult, to make it interesting. You don't throw too many enemies. You throw, you know, a, a lar an increasingly larger amount, but not too many. Yeah. And again, similar to the AVP games. Now, the boss battles are just okay. They're, they're basically, you know, it's, it's not a fight so much as just there's, there's a minor objective you have to complete. And as you're doing that, this big creature is trying to stop you. And, yeah, they're, they're very easy. Though there's at least one where I could barely tell if I was winning or even doing damage. And it's again, you know, the, the patches couldn't do much to fix it. And I, I'm not sure they've particularly changed since before the patches. One of them, you get to use an exosuit for a few minutes. And it's basically okay. The controls are pretty clunky. And in this fight, you also have to pick up both the healing items and armor. And again, you do so by pressing use, which might mean that you'll accidentally leave the exosuit right in the middle of a fight. So, yeah. The atmosphere at times is pretty good. There are some jump scares that can really work. There are times where you feel kind of overwhelmed. And a lot of the atmosphere comes from just slowly exploring areas and quite good sound design. You go through a lot of areas that are either completely abandoned or overrun by xenomorphs. Maybe xenomorphs have clearly, there's clearly been fighting. They've torn through doors and walls or floors, you know, there's evidence of like, yeah, there's, there's clear signs of fighting. You pass a lot of dead bodies, although that doesn't tend to have that much of an effect on you, I found. And like AVP 2, it really convinces you of the world more than the first AVP game. And the music is quite effective, similar to AVP 2 and AVP 2010. The graphics are decent. I, I don't know if they've maybe also been addressed in patches, similar to how System Shock 2 got the high resolution textures unofficial patch. There are four difficulty settings, and I, I've heard that it used to be a very easy game. It is not a t too easy of a game anymore. Even on the, you know, on the easiest difficulty setting, it will still challenge you. You know, and I, and one thing I'm really glad that they fixed is apparently before you barely even had to shoot enemies. You know, the the AI would take care of it for you. Now you definitely do have to. There's no point in this game currently that I could just go through without dealing with enemies or where enemies weren't a threat. You know, like I said, it occasionally breaks, but very, very rarely. We're talking a few minutes out of the six hours. There do remain some invisible textureless spawn zones for xenomorphs. And for some reason, at times, it will jump out to the third-person perspective camera when you die. And this really takes you out of it. And again, that's not something that needs to happen ever. The, you know, the, the second AVP game did sometimes. I don't think the, third, the, the 2010 did. And certainly the, the first AVP game never did. In, in the first AVP game, when you die, the screen turns black. That's how you do something like that, because if everything is from the first person perspective, then everything's suddenly turning black. Yeah, that means death. And then you also hear that you die, of course. 
and sometimes the Sometimes there can be some cool gore from the third person perspective, but mostly not. Mostly you just see the the character die. You know, some even if you're grabbed and it's like a almost a cutscene of a death scene, it might still be really boring. You cannot carry any healing items, which I appreciate. And you do get to feel strong, similar at, at times, similar to the AVP two and twenty ten, but unlike the the first one where you really always felt weak. Now, as I've mentioned in other videos, I find that any piece of creative expression should basically have some reason to exist. It shouldn't just be because, you know, someone, you know, just just because. There should be some reason. You're trying to communicate something, or you're trying to further a story, something. I don't know that I'd really say this has one. If, I mean, I suppose you could say that something is accomplished by the end of the game or that yeah but at the end of the day I don't really think it has one which I would say every AVP game does no matter how bad those got there was always something that they were trying to do I mean the, the worst that franchise ever got was Primal Hunt and if it if it accomplished nothing else, it allowed you to play as a pred alien in single player, and that's kind of interesting. Now, I wasn't sure when I approached this game first if you were going to get to play as a xenomorph. And honestly, if you know you you can, but if they had made the decision not to, I could see why. The for for one thing, the resources you know that go into you know a, a user interface controls and such for a xenomorph, you know, yeah, they could have been put into the you know improving the marine campaign instead. The and and the the xenomorph is you know the alien is or you know started out alienating and you know the the moment that there's more than one movie that you know you go further away from that but playing as one you know more than more than any of that you know you you start to have some sympathy for you put yourself in its place you know, that does take away from this alienating effect. Certainly, mowing down aliens by the dozen does as well, but less so. You know, and of course, since, you know, the AVP1 and especially to even Primal Hunt and 2010, you know, not getting to play as an alien, not to mention not getting to play as a predator. Crap, I just mentioned it. I'm I'm sorry. Will of course disappoint a lot of players. But the you know, not playing as predator here does mean that they focus on the other two. And when you play as a as an alien, it's a it's from the third person perspective. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's it especially works well for the wall walking, since you can always see which way is up now. And you know, the the they they also of course had to resolve the issue that aliens are too hard to animate. 
it's a lot easier to aim the leap. Basically, now you you get an actual you know indication, similar to how like when you throw you know grenade throwing in a lot of games now has this kind of predicting arc kind of thing. That's what you get for the leap now, and yeah, you know exactly how that's going to happen. The, the same is true of spitting as the spitter with spit. And the... yeah, you know, that was always an issue before the the leaping. Wall walking is really wonky. The The, you know, I didn't get to play a lot of multiplayer in this, but I would definitely say it's it's up there with the, you know, AVP1, you know, AVP2 and 2010 both have pretty good, but yeah, it was really difficult, and I, I don't know, maybe if I got to play for longer, I would get more of a, a feel for it, but yeah, and you do not get to play through the life cycle, and there's no Xeno versus Xeno mode. And the controls for the Xenomorph are also somewhat difficult to get into. And with this steep learning curve and the rest of the players being, you know, veterans at it, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll get more into that. But basically with the wall running, you can now be rushing around chasing the Marines. You can blend with darkness. You can see through walls some to, you know, see where your your targets are. It's very stealth based, and you know you're you're stalking, you're hiding in vents that you you press use to enter a vent and you just move to get back out of it. But this is similar to the single player of AVP 2010, and it's very useful. You can very easily run away from a marine if there's a vent nearby. And the you know you you cannot practice playing as a as a xenomorph outside of multiplayer, which is also the only place you can earn XP to upgrade. And with this steep learning curve, it does mean that you're you know, you're very slowly progressing and improving, whereas the other players, you know, com coming into it now, today, you know, other players are much more seasoned, and yeah, they have unlocked attacks that you have not. You know, if, if there were way more players, so there were a lot of, you know, people on different, like, levels of experience, you know, then you could play against ones that were as experienced as you, but instead it just means, yeah, and I do feel like this is something that could have been fixed by just saying, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna put words in the mouths of, you know, other players, but personally, if I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to be playing this again anytime soon, but if this was a multiplayer game that I kept playing, even though there weren't very many who were playing, and every so often someone completely new would come into the game, I would be fine with, like, if the game said, okay, some of the players are on a really low level, that means the rest of the players have the the same attacks as the low level new ones so that it's not yeah that that would make a huge difference now the when you're when you're playing as a xenomorph there are three types the so-called soldier xenomorph, which is just a regular xenomorph, basically, the spitter, and then the lurker, which, 
you know, it's, it's weaker, but it has increased range. And if it moves slowly enough, it can actually avoid the detection through the motion tracker. Now, the among the alien attacks, I'm not going to go over every single one, but I just want to give an, a clear image of just how excuse me, how many different attacks and how varied they are, because this is something I have not seen in very many other reviews, and I really do think that that's something... It's, it's way more of an open game when you're playing as an alien than the AVP games when you're playing, you know, yeah, single player or, or multiplayer, but yeah, you know, they obviously, you know, and, and I do want to make clear also the three types, you know, they, there are some things where they have the same attacks and such, but they do also have very different ones. It's not, you know, it's not like, okay, playing as a spitter, well, you can also spit, but otherwise it's the same thing. No, they're very different in some ways, at least. You know, you some of them will have the, the claw, and there's obviously the fast, weak, regular attack, and there's one that's that spins, I don't know how useful that is, that, you know, that's only for if you're, like, surrounded, but, you know, then there's one that's really strong, but doesn't have a lot of range, you can attack with the tail, and then, again, there's, you know, a fast, and maybe not the strongest one, there's one where you kind of lunge, which is slow, you can whip with it, which has a short range, there's the ability to charge up, and I should also, I should specify, you you can have one of these. It's it's like the the guns for the marines. There's you know the when you're playing as a marine in multiplayer, you have to choose one primary weapon, one secondary weapon, and one pistol, and that's it. The the alien has a primary attack, a secondary attack, an ability, a mutation, and maybe one other thing. But yeah, you know, so you have the two attacks and then an ability that might be attack related or might be something else, you know. But yeah, so you're choosing between the ones I'm listing. You know, among the abilities are just a, a, a brief dodge in any direction. You know, you can play dead in a, a couple of different ways. There's one that basically sends you immediately to the, the ceiling so you can make a quick escape. Then there's the, the carapace, and this is basically, you know, this is this is armor, basically. There's no, you know, I, I could list the different versions, but if you've ever played an RPG, you know what armor works like, you know. Yeah. Then there's the, the, the trait, which, you know, you, you start out not having any, you know, you, you have to unlock all of these, and... You can't just, and it's not also, it's it's not just, okay, now I want to unlock this. No, some of them are locked to specific, like, ranks, and you start on rank zero or rank one, something like that. But, yeah, among the traits, you know, there's increased speed, increased strength, maybe you heal better, or, yeah. The... The spit, you know, starts out as just this ranged attack, but you can, there's there's one version of the spit where it bounces off walls, there's one that's essentially like a shotgun, like you want to be close, but then it also has, you know, yeah, it, it hits a larger area up close, you know, there's one where it's like this smoke trap that's activated by proximity. The lurker has the the leap and you know the the leap can, can the, the leap can maybe tackle, maybe it's really fast, maybe it's easy to escape afterwards, maybe it does an area of effect knockdown. I don't know if the area of effect knockdown is all that useful necessary, but at least, you know, it it adds variety. Now the, the DLC, Stasis Interrupted, 
you you wake up as this civilian Lisbeth. You're on this ship and you're you're looking for your parents. The the ship was diverted to intercept the Sulaco leaving LV 426's orbit. And I almost feel like this is a spoiler, but I do want to just say, just so you know, the first 20 minutes are this bad outlast kind of, you know, it's it's basically stealth, line of science, line of sight stealth, and it's just not that good. And after that, you do get a gun, and it becomes the first person shooter that it was sold as. You know, for this stealth, you're just, you're walking down halls, you're opening doors, just, yeah, you know, there, there are some turrets that you have to, you know, avoid the laser of, and then you turn them off and such. It's just, it's not very interesting. The engine does not really work that well for just single player stealth, I find. There is this really awkwardly staged action scene that explains basically why Hicks is alive after the events of Alien, the, yeah, the second movie, which really doesn't explain why the, yeah, the, the face-hugging of, you know, in, in Alien 3 still really doesn't, of, of Ripley, still really doesn't particularly make sense. And basically, you know, I, I noted that the, the, you know, you play as more than one character in Stasis Interrupted, and it's almost like you're, you're tagging, and then they're it, the next player character. And there's actually, you, you find this, this log by Newt, and it's, you know, after the events of the, the second movie, so, you know, it's, it's basically, she, she was asked by Ripley to do a recording to Hicks before she went into cryosleep. And, I mean, it's, it's cute enough. I'm, I'm not entirely sure if it's the same actress. I do think that they completely missed an opportunity. She does not say, I'm sorry I bit your hand. I really find that that, that, was, that would have been a perfect place to put something like that. She, she just says, you seemed nice. I didn't like the other soldiers, but you seemed nice. There's one log by Bishop, which is basically just, he's, he does the, the, the data thing, you know, the next, Star Trek, the next generation, you know, he's like the, you know, I, I, they were, they were very impressed by my skills with a knife. I asked them some personal questions and they laughed. This requires further investigation. You know, you go to the surface of LV-426. It does spend too much time filling in plot holes from the main campaign. And you cannot use DLC guns in it. But, like I said earlier, it's two and a half hours long. And if you've gotten the main game and you like the universe and you like the second movie, I would definitely get it. Now, the DLC Sharp Sticks... It's these explosive darts that embed themselves in the, you know, either the the surface they hit, you know, yeah, what they hit, the whether it's, you know, the surface of, yeah, it's, it's, if it's the level itself or an, an enemy and, yeah, then explode. It's a very interesting weapon, really mixes stuff up, and it also makes one particular boss fight very, very easy. Then there's the DLC Sauna shotgun. The game has enough shotguns already, and you really didn't need one that reloads after every shot. Yes, it fires both barrels at once. There's nothing you can do about that. The ammo for it is rare, and you cannot customize it. Now, the DLC Collector's Edition has the plasma rifle that they mentioned in the movie. It's very slow, and then there's this stun grenade, neither of which are particularly useful. The firing range that comes with it is quite good. It's a good place to familiarize yourself with the guns, but it's really something that could and should have come with the main game and 
be free and yeah I wouldn't advise it. The DLC limited edition pack has Apone, Hicks, Hudson and Drake as playable characters in multiplayer. Some some have noted that you know they're not necessarily that useful for the stealth multiplayer so yeah and do also note that the faces are at least slightly off on every single one of them. Ripley's flamethrower you know, flamethrower pulse rifle combo, which, yes, can fire a pulse rifle, a flamethrower, and pulse rifle grenades. You know, it's in place of, you know, it, 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 in exchange, it can't, you can't aim down the sights, which, you know, how would you with that thing, with that thing? I'm almost certain shields only fires it from the hip. But yeah, it's a really good weapon, and I... Personally, I would get the, the DLC just for her flamethrower, but, you know, not everyone is gonna. The, the DLC Bug Hunt is basically a horde mode similar to Survivor, but it seems like there's more, like, it's, it's more open and it's more of a different mode where Survivor is basically, you know, more or less just a regular multiplayer experience, but... I can't say it because I never got to play Survivor. The, you know, some have noted that the easy to exploit AI makes bug hunt very predictable. You just need to know where to bunker down. You know, you, you shoot to make money, you set up some turrets. You know, the, the bad AI pathing is why it's so much easier. I barely got to play it, and I, I have a few more notes, but I'll, I'll get to those. The DLC Reconnaissance Pack has four levels, never played any of them. The DLC, limit, the DLC Movie Map Pack has a total of four new levels, some of them are for more than one mode, again, never played them. Now, co-op has drop in, drop out, you know, for one to four players, so similar to Left 4 Dead, but, you know, you you can't play a level you haven't reached. I, I don't know for sure if you can in Left 4 Dead, I don't think I ever tested you know, try to play a level that I hadn't reached, but I don't think Left 4 Dead prevents you from playing a later level. If if I recall, you, I'm I'm almost certain I, at least once experienced playing a level that I hadn't gotten to myself. But I I like that you can't. This is so plot driven. You, yeah, you'd be kind of lost if you were suddenly where yeah, Left 4 Dead. It's you know. I, I really, really like Left 4 Dead, but it's it's not that plot-driven, basically. And it's not supposed to be, especially the first one. The, the plot is just why you're moving through the levels. The, but one other difference between the two games is, in this, it is either you're playing by yourself or it's, you know, two to four co-op players. There's no... You know, you can't be running around and then suddenly someone jumps in and you're two players the way you can in Left 4 Dead. You know, there, there. If if you in Left 4 Dead, you know, you you want to play Left 4 Dead and you you look, there isn't really a match in set in the specific level that you want to play. You can just start up your own match in that level and someone might join you. You know, depending on when. Yeah, you know. You can't be absolutely certain that they will, but you can set it up and they might, you know, but I, you know, I mean, in theory, someone could have jumped into my match and made it a co-op any, at any point during the six hours I played the campaign, but that's just not how it's set up. And you, you cannot start a co-op match without at least two players, regardless. It's, yeah, either or. And for some reason, the when when you press a tab, you know to to check status, 
it's always this scoreboard, you know, whether you're playing single player or, you know, in co-op and especially multiplayer, it makes sense that it's a scoreboard. You know, it says players, kills, score, but in single player, you know, it completely destroys the illusion whenever you check your status. You know, yes, it also has your current objective and, you know, how many you found of the collectibles in the level, but yeah. And you can also play local multiplayer with two people, you know, not in the PC version, I'm pretty sure, but yeah, console versions. You can revive your co-op partner, but it never really feels, you, you never feel like a squad. And it really, again, like I said, it, it, it's a very similar thing to Left 4 Dead, and thus it it's going to be compared to Left 4 Dead and you know going you know especially Left 4 Dead 2 which is so much better and came out several years before this you know Left 4 Dead 2 everyone's carrying everyone can carry one big item one small item a main weapon and then you know one or two pistols and different characters will you know, different players will be carrying around different things and, you know, help each other out. You know, you, you'll be temporarily grabbed by a special infected or you'll be, you know, incapacitated and then need someone to help you up. In this, there's, excuse me, basically nothing like that. Like I said, you're running around with all the different guns at the same time. And the only thing you can really do for each other is, you know, obviously keep aliens off each other's back. But, yeah, the, the one thing that really is, is that when you're being straddled by an alien, possibly also a face hugger, but I didn't experience that in my very short times playing co-op. If you're being straddled by an alien, another player can shoot that alien, which, you know, yeah, that can't actually you know, while, while you're trying to push it off, you'll, you'll grab a pistol once you've pushed, off or pushed it off, or if you're, you know, temporarily, you know, if you're almost dying, and then the other player can revive you. But if there's an alien straddling you, another player can actually just straight up shoot it off you. The... This, this isn't as big of a deal in every level because it, it varies, but in I, I only played co-op in the first level. In that level, you encounter a lot of different characters that are all named, and they have like a name written right over their head. The same is true of co-op players, and some of you know some players too actually have names that sound like names. You know, of course some are you know I, I play with this one guy called like Purr Purr. Okay, that, you know, as in what a cat says, cat does. Obviously, that's not a Marine's name, because the, the Marines are all going by their real names, you know. But some of them do use fairly, you know, regular-sounding names, and they didn't even bother to, like, change the font or the color of how the names are written. It's Again, it feels like it was slapped on at the last minute, and they didn't think about this. The, and, and there are also lines that really don't work for, you know, they'll, it's, it's very clear that the characters are talk, the, the other characters in the game are talking to one person, not four players. And honestly, a lot of it could have been fixed just instead of them, you know, for, for one thing, they could have said you when referring to, you know, because you can be one person or however many people and maybe if there was like an explanation that winters used to be in this unit that you know consists of four people and either you're playing you know as you're you know it the the lines are read the same way whether it's co-op or single player and either the you know that unit is complete and it's the four players and they're you know let's just say that that unit was called winter so every time they said winter they were referring to the unit 
and when it's only the one character, then he's the only one still being called Winter, because it was a nickname that the whole unit was given that could work. But again, instead, it's very clear that the player character is just named Winter. It's not anything else. And there's, yeah, like I said, this would be very easy to fix. Now, matchmaking lets you choose a random level of, of the ones you've reached, but not a random difficulty setting. So, the, you know, and, and of the, you know, and, and it also doesn't, you, you can't say, you know, matchmake, and then at the same, you know, be matchmaking for either the main campaign or Stasis Interrupted, at the same time you have to choose between one of those so yeah it really makes it the, the matchmaking is very very old-fashioned very limited and really does the multiplayer no favors you know multiplayer the the person playing multiplayer or the multiplayer aspect of the game pick one now the DLC are marked very clearly as, as separate from the core. You know, the Firing Range, Stasis Interrupted, and Bug Hunt are all very clearly marked as separate so that you don't accidentally, you know, if, if, you, if you're selecting DLC, obviously a lot less people are going to be playing that than the core game. And the... I'm, I feel like I've mentioned I've mentioned parts of this, I forget if I've tied it all together. Both species can spawn really cool power-ups that are limited in amount, but make things interesting in the match. The the Xeno can be you know playing as the, the boiler or crusher, and the marine can pick up the smart gun, the flamethrower, the RPG, or the grenade launcher, only one of those at the same time. Multiplayer is basically dead. You cannot get a server list. The you know you can like host and invite a friend, or you can matchmake. If you start matchmaking, you can't invite a friend. It'll stop the matchmaking. The when you try to matchmake for some reason it says friend only even though you've chosen online this appears to be a typo i i read some someone say that you needed at least one person already on your you know on your friends list before you could host a public game but i was able to join a game that wasn't actually i suppose it's possible that, that was because two of the others were already on the friends list so I can't say for sure. You can say random level, but not random mode. This is a huge mistake that they made. Because this means that, yeah, you'll just be gradually searching through the different modes. You can't just tell it, I want to play multiplayer in this game. I don't care which mode. You have to select a mode. And in the, the ones where it's a difficulty setting, also a difficulty setting. You can say random map, but that doesn't give it a lot of wiggle room. When the game has tried matchmaking for five minutes, it automatically stops and then has the goal to say that you, the player, have chosen to strict, you know, parameters. When, yeah, I said it as loosely as I possibly could, it's the game that makes it too strict. Now, the let's see. I played four matches overall, and 31 times I sat and just let it matchmake. And we're talking, I tried every single mode of matchmaking for the five minutes that does. So, yeah, that's 35 minutes. 31 times and you know of the of the 35 times I sat down to do it it actually got four 
you know, two matches of team deathmatch, one match of bug hunt, and one match of co-op. And you know, and if if you want to play a game that has human enemies, you know, that has marines fighting xenomorphs, you know, last I checked, ABP 10's multiplayer wasn't dead, and you know, sure, you'll also be dealing with a predator, and in some ways, it's not as good multiplayer, but at least it isn't dead. And that's, you know, yeah, there are a lot of pros in that multiplayer. Again, I did a video specifically on that game. You know, you, you can... As I record this, I don't know how long this video is going to end up being, but as you're watching it, you do know, and that's how long it gets without me going into detail about anything other than this one thing at a time. There are simply too few active players for matchmaking to work properly, as, as far as I understand. Now, it is true that you can add, f add as friend players who frequently play multiplayer. There are specific groups you can join that, you know, focus on playing co-op and or multiplayer of this. And I'm afraid I simply, you know, I, I spend very little of my spare time playing video games and simply I would, you know, if, if I joined one of those groups, most of the time I wouldn't be able to play. So, yeah, I did not join those groups. The, the people who, you know, there, there are some people playing, but yeah, it is, unfortunately, it is on those terms. You can't just sit down when it most suits you and play. And unfortunately, that's the only way it does work for me. I spend very, very little of my spare time playing video games, in part because Carpal, you know, Carpal Tunnel. But yeah, you know, if, if you're just matchmaking, it's hard to find people to play with, and you end up playing with yourself. Don't get me wrong, I'll play with myself, I've played with myself all day long, but it is a multiplayer game, so you just, you want to grab someone else and get them going too. Among the modes are extermination, where you either kill or defend Xeno eggs. There are five levels for it and five DLC levels. Escape, where you run through Xeno turf, basically, and the you know you compete over the fastest time out of 15 minutes tops. There are two levels and one DLC level. Survivor, which is like the AVP one and you know AVP 10 2010 mode but unlike in those it, here it's only multiplayer not single player it's a horde mode with a time limit basically three levels for that team deathmatch where you can play with as little as four players total which is how I was able to play it at all I don't think we were ever more than five people at any given time and it started when there were four of us basically you play two rounds and after the first round both teams swap species and it seemed to me like it was about six minutes per round and yeah in the two matches it took me about 27 minutes total or lasted for that long depending on your perspective Five levels and another five with DLC. Now the level design is quite good. It's very, you know, these very closed claustrophobic levels that work well for the alien and that the Marine can still, you know, get through as long as he uses all his equipment, right? And ten levels with ten extra with DLC. And the levels you know, a number of them are directly recreated from the films. 
and the you know it's they are made with the alien franchise in mind you know the the second film especially not with the predator and that really does help that they don't have to you know they're they're yeah every avp game has some trace that this isn't your pure alien experience there's a predator here too so let's have some nice bright forests let's have more open areas that he can use and yeah now in single player i already mentioned you have a mission selector this is you know this is goes on the list of things that I feel should be in every game that you know there, there are some games where it doesn't make a lot of sense where it's too story driven for you to be able to jump back and forth between missions but you know whenever it makes sense it should be there you can jump between levels without any problem you can switch difficulty setting you know before selecting a mission regardless of you know some something that I do love about the first game but I don't the first AVP but doesn't work for every game is you can't complete you can't play level 2 on a difficulty setting that you didn't beat level 1 at and so on and so forth if you want and, and there are five bonus levels and if you want all five you have to complete the entire game one level at a time on the hardest difficulty setting and that's really difficult in this you can you know play through the entire game on easy and then try the last level on hard on the hardest for example and yeah that works you know that adds replayability you can be jumping back and forth you know maybe you figure well this part might be fun on a harder difficulty or i want to see if this is as difficult on an easier difficulty and stuff like that and you can be, you know, jumping back and forth between, you know, it, it worked for single player, for stay, stasis interrupted, and you don't lose any progress other than, you know, if, if, you, if you're in a level in either, you know, yeah, you'll, you'll lose the, the checkpoint progress that you made since the last time. But at the same time, Stasis Interrupted and the single player, main single player, are also separate. You don't have to play one of them and then the other. I played them both at the same time. The, you know, when you start one up, you're, yeah, they, they have separate checkpoint saves and separate, you know, when, when you complete a level in one, it doesn't mean anything for the checkpoint of the other one or the progress in the other one. And it, yeah, and the, the, they recreated a number of settings. And similar to the second film and Die Hard and such, in some of the levels you will be moving, in, in a lot of the levels, you will be moving through some of the same areas more than once. So you'll recognize areas from earlier in the level. And if you've been, you know, maybe you'll early on in the level walk past a dropship. And then later on in the level you'll be told, we have to get to the dropship. And so in your mind, it's not just, you know, okay, so I've just been given an, you know, it's still A to B to C because it's a linear game. It tells you what direction to go. But in your mind, you remember, oh, right, the dropship, that's that area. Oh, it was pretty empty when I was there before. But now that I've encountered a lot of xenomorphs, when I get back there, it's probably going to be completely swamped because it's such a big area. There's room for a lot of them to be there at the same time. Things like that. That works really well. And that's, you know, that's an, an aspect they got from the movie that works really well that isn't in any of the other, not, not in any AVP game. The, 
I, I found that I quite liked the, the settings chosen. There's... And, and the, the levels are relatively simple. There's a sewer level, because there always is one. The... You know, some of the levels use the, the pull, the vacuum of space well. The one level has you look out of the window of your of, of one of these big ships and see the other big ship, and it really captures the scope. You know, we we get a sense of just how big the ship is from the inside in the film and a number of the levels, but seeing it from the outside is a little too rare. You, you see it from the outside some in the second AVP game in some of the cutscenes, but you don't really see anything close to it. You don't have a, a basis of comparison for it. And in this, you look out with your own two eyes and see the ship, and so you know how big it is in comparison. Yeah. And there are times where your surroundings will be falling apart around you, you know, explosions close to you, maybe part of the level will be at a diagonal angle because, you know, something is falling apart or has fallen apart. There's this one level where you're told you have to set up five sensors to set up a perimeter. And, you know, that makes decent enough sense. And it's this abandoned area. You haven't fought xenomorphs in a little bit. So it's like, you know, okay, by the time I'm done with this, there's going to be xenomorphs, obviously. And maybe I'll be attacked while I'm placing. So, you know, it's a cool little idea. But for some reason, they wrote a line for every single... Maybe this is the, the being a TV writer thing. You know, maybe that's why, or I, I don't know what exactly, but every single one, it's like... Okay, for the first one and the last one, that's fine, but you don't have to for every single one, because he's not saying anything. He's just saying, I placed one, and then the other one says, okay. They rephrase that. You know, in one of them, he says, check that it's receiving a signal. Signal received. You know, but it's still just saying, I placed one. The... Every single cutscene that involves a xenomorph weakens the xenomorph. It's really unfortunate. And it's not that it's not that they can't show you a xenomorph without you directly being affected by it, because they do with the boiler. It's just specific cutscenes. Yeah. Now Gradually, there will also be more and more friction between some of the Marines and, yeah, and some of that works fairly well. You get to get very close to the derelict and it's just as huge as it is in the movie. You know, you yeah, you actually get to walk underneath some of it and get really close to it. And yes, that is, you know, you, you get to go just by it in the first AVP game as well. But here it feels quote-unquote real. You know, in that it feels like, oh, hey, here was, this is something from one of the movies there, there you go. We're just gonna, we're just gonna plop it down right in front of you and hope you like it. It's not gonna make any sense. And the, it took me a while to realize what actually happens if you get to a checkpoint save by yourself. Any and all marine AI will be teleported to right in front of you. To, to there, you know, so you, it, and this is of course so you don't have to wait for them to get there, but at least, you know, it's it's pure Star Trek, suddenly they're just teleporting in. The, the game even does a small 
In fact, to bring attention to it, just teleport them into behind the player. So it's like, oh, we, we caught up while you weren't looking or something. There's at least one boss battle that I am sure that they they thought it was going to work out in one particular way and that's how you the player will naturally try to approach it because you can tell what they want you to do but it doesn't work that way you actually have to do it in a different way that's kind of counterintuitive I am willing to bet they thought they could get it work to work in the first way and then they realized they couldn't it wouldn't work with the program or something so they changed it and they just left the old solution right there in plain sight. I kept wondering what I was doing wrong because I was so certain that it was the right solution. I already mentioned the difficulty spike. And this is when I get to further notes on Bug Hunt. By the time I finally got to play Bug Hunt, I had put almost all of my notes on the whiteboard, which is why I, you know, I put way too many notes on to go back and delete any. So anyway, I played a total of 28 minutes of Bug Hunt in the one match. And it's... It's pretty underwhelming considering that Killing Floor is out there and yeah, this is basically Killing Floor with less enemy variation in, in design, less, you know, with no one playing, no, I, I couldn't find a way to change the loadout once I had, you know, once I was in the match except maybe quit and rejoin, which I saw one of the others do and I assume that was why, but I wasn't about to throw away the the you know option of actually playing. I figured that the matchmaking would just not be able to find the match or something. I've experienced that with other matchmaking games. No mods and only three levels. You know, it's yeah, just play Killing Floor instead. It's so much more. There's so much more to that than Bug Hunt, but yeah. You know, the idea is you kill for money, it's that simple, that grotesque. The tougher the enemy, the, the bigger your paycheck for it. And, you know, in, in set parts of the level are, re, you know, these static stations for refilling your armor, your health, the armor, the, the ammo for your primary weapon, the secondary ammo for your primary weapon. I didn't find a single place to rearm my secondary weapon, so yeah, and the, these also seem to run out, again, all this is in the 28 minutes, they seem to run out and you can't see before you're right next to it if it's out of ammo, and you you can buy the, the things that spawn as power-ups in the other modes again at set points now the basically to do well you have to spend the cash you've saved up to open up new areas and arm these so-called threat suppressors which apparently mean that not as many enemies will spawn in the next portion as if you hadn't armed it as far as I can tell and I think enemies can like disable it or destroy it or something and new areas also mean new refill stations now if someone is is down for a few seconds you can revive them if they stay down for several seconds they will die they they lay there with the lie there with the pistol out if you die you can just buy your way back with a thousand so I died several times because I didn't know what I was doing and because I had killed enough at least before that point I could just go back although of course in the long run you know you're gonna have 
problems because you should be spending that money opening new areas and such. And in another strange design decision that feels like some of this was just slapped together, the scoreboard will show how many you've killed and the 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 score I think but not the amount of money you have which it does show in killing floor which you know I the the whole idea is that you you share the money so that you you know if if a player isn't doing that well and they need money to buy some in in this case it wouldn't be guns it would be ammo which is also just it, it just it makes more sense that you're buying newer and bigger guns but in that you can of course also just rearm and you can actually do it as long as you have money not just anyway the yeah it, it just in in both you're supposed to share money and you can you can give I think it's a hundred dollars per to, to any fellow player just you know stand next to him and throw him the money but you know when when you can't see how much each other have you just have to you know trust them or communicate about it and of course you know communicate about it sure useful but why not just put it on the scoreboard again the way it is in killing floor I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.